Okay. On the afternoon of Wednesday 9th of August 1922, a Free State soldier named Flood was shot by anti-treaty forces who had taken up positions in the hills overlooking Rochestown and Douglas, hoping to obstruct the advance of the National Army on Cork City. Flood was one of a detachment of troops advancing across a, a field in a bid to outflank a group of IRA volunteers positioned at a sharp bend in the road. Emerging through a gate onto the road, he was hit by a burst of IRA, IRA machine gun fire. As Flood lay dying, Frank O'Donoghue, a Republican who had fought together with him in the War of Independence, but who was now on the anti-treaty side, broke cover, running out to take his hand and to say an act of contrition in his ear. This moment epitomizes the bitter ironies of the Civil War that have made it such a difficult episode in Ireland's recent history. In this paper, we'll highlight further forgotten landscapes of the Civil War. Like other elements of Ireland's post-1700 heri heritage, as we've heard today already, the landscapes of the Civil War are afforded no statutory protection. This is compounded by the particular challenges around remembering and coming to terms with this contentious period in Ireland's revolutionary past. Yet the material residues of the Civil War have significant potential to illuminate the details of the conflict. More than this, though, they speak powerfully of the texture of human emotion and experience, not only of those who fought, suffered and died, but also of the civilians caught up in the conflict. The sharp bend in the road at which Franco Donoghue and his comrades were positioned has now been bypassed, but it survives as a quiet lane with modern housing on either side. The iron gate through which flood passed is still present, known locally as Battlefield Gate, its frame is pierced with bullet holes that stand as testament to the ferocity of the fighting that took place here. The Civil War had begun less than two months earlier in June 1922. The negotiations that followed the end of the War of Independence in 1921 led to the signing of a treaty that partitioned Ireland and required members of the new Irish government to swear an oath of allegiance to the British Crown, a situation that many IRA volunteers opposed. The Civil War began when the National Army or pro-treaty forces opened fire on anti-treaty Republicans occupying the four ports in Dublin. By early August 1922, National Army landings on the coasts of Cork and Kerry had put the anti-treaty IRA on the defensive in Munster. Heavy fighting saw pro-treaty forces secure Cork City on 11th of August. Eventually, the National Army's superior numbers and resources aided their final victory but not before the bitter struggle had dragged on for almost a year. The battlefield gate signposts the archaeological potential of Civil War landscapes, specifically in this case, the area between Passage West and Cork City, which witnessed some of the most intensive clashes as pro-treaty forces advanced on the city. Although the docks of Passage West have been significantly reworked since the Free State landings there in the early hours of the morning on Tuesday 8th of August, much of the historic street case, streetscape remains intact. The buildings in this contemporary photo are a little change from those taken in the photo, in the photo taken by William Hogan uh, on the top left, who accompanied the National Army troops on their entry into passage on that day. There's little surprise then that features such as bullet impact scars survive in the fabric of some of these buildings. On the war, wall of the Criterion Bar and its neighboring buildings, just opposite what was then the Royal Victoria Dockyard, the damage caused by bullets fired by National Army troops remains visible. They were created soon after the landing as the Free State troops emerged, uh, em emerged from the docks and returned the fire of Republicans positioned on high ground above them. Other buildings tell the opposite side of the story. The houses of Somerville Terrace display the evidence for incoming Republican bullets, a reminder of the harassing fire they discharged from across the channel in Carrigaloo on Great Island. The heaviest fighting took place in the vicinity of Rochestown on Tuesday and Wednesday, and most, ca most casualties in the battle, of, battle for Cork were recorded in this area. Two eyewitness accounts, one by Dr. James Lynch, a local doctor who tended the wounded, and another by Farmer, F Father Michael, a priest in the Capuchin Monastery at Rochestown, provide richly textured detail on the events of those days, as well as a sketch map of the engagement. Combining these with contemporary newspaper accounts, the second edition Ordnance Survey maps and the 1911 census data, it is possible to identify many of the key sites of the battle, to assess how the opposing forces moved through the landscape, and crucially, to examine the extent to which buildings and other landscape features that appear in the accounts of the conflict have survived into the present. 
In the summer of 2020, we conducted an initial phase of fieldwork to assess the archaeological survival of the buildings, boundaries and features associated with this 1922 conflict landscape. Many of these survive today and can be mapped on the ground. For example, the road bridge at Rochestown, which was blown up by anti-treaty troops on Tuesday morning, lies to one side of the modern road. The rebuilt central section remains clearly visible. Surviving buildings include Dr Lynch's house, which served as a key National Army position and field hospital during the heaviest fighting, and which is today part of the Gary Duff Sports Centre. A labourer's cottage, from which anti-treaty forces fired on the temporary headquarters established by Generals Dalton and Ennis close to the monastery, survives, albeit much altered. The cottage of William and Mary Cronin, where three Republican soldiers, famously including Scottish volunteer Ian Scotty Mackenzie, Kennedy made a last stand, also appears extant, though likely much altered. The Cronin Cottage and nearby Battlefield Gate were at the vortex of the heaviest fighting of all in Rochestown. One of the most important surviving features in this area are the field boundaries that the Republicans used as defensive positions and from where they laid down intensive machine gun fire. Some of the National Army men advancing over the exposed ground from the Lynch House towards these positions were First World War veterans, and that day's experience must have been traumatically reminiscent of the Western Front. Some of the injuries certainly were, as attested to by applications in the military service pensions collection. Ex-British soldier James Gavigan was struck in the head during the attack and only lived a short time afterwards. When the firing ceased, his Mullingar comrades knelt around his body and prayed for the happy repose of his soul. Fellow Free Stater James Madden's section suffered particularly heavy casualties at the hands of the machine guns. Madden from Brackernard, Balmeslow, was killed instantly when he was hit in the forehead. On the Republican side, 19-year-old Republican Christopher Olden lingered for two days after being struck in the intestines during the Rochestown fighting, before succumbing to shock and hemorrhaging in the South Infirmary. The engagement had a lasting impact on the civilian population as well, not least of whom were the elderly Cronins themselves, who screamed and called while the status surrounded the cottage a building Scotty Mackenzie and fellow anti-treaty volunteer James Maloney died defending. A photograph published in the Cork Examiner on 23rd of, the, 23rd of August shows the Cronins standing forlornly outside their shattered home holding possessions riddled with bullet hole holes. Now I'm going to hopefully pass over to Damien there. Thanks a million, Joe. Um, Are we good there? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, so I'm I'm only going to be speaking for a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to take us through kind of um, a, a small bit of the process of what we were doing again, just reiterating some of what Joe was saying, but also to discuss the remarkable degree to which this battlefield, which is the most the the the, the largest conflict um, that took place in Cork. Um, during the entire revolutionary period, and we know Cork was an incredibly significant locale, it suffered the most deaths of anywhere during the revolutionary period, the degree to which it is invisible in the landscape. So Passage West, for any of you know it, is a, is a beautiful area, it has a fantastic museum that does mention the fighting there, the, the, the Maritime Museum, it's popular local walk, you can walk along the railway in, in along this area, the image of the bridge that, that Joe was showing um, um, we, we, when we actually first looked at that bridge, we were sitting having our lunch, looking straight at it from a park picnic bench. Um, there is nothing, absolutely zero, relating to this engagement that would tell you it was in the area. And it seems not a massive effort to try and identify um, very specific locations. And indeed, this image here that you're seeing is the main um, revolutionary monument in Passage West, and it actually relates um, to the death of a member of Cork Number no. One Brigade during the War of Independence, um, so really significant um, that that it's not being remembered. And we might think, you know, and maybe there's some truth to the fact that it's because it's the Civil War. But I would contend that actually, if you look at a lot of these sites, for example, say the site of the Cross Barry ambush in in County Cork, there is virtually nothing there to actually show you the landscape and what survives. And so this, another map drawn by the erstwhile Sarah Neeland for the, for the project, um, was our first effort to try and identify um, the different um, locations relating to the movements um, of the various protagonists after these um, seaborne landings by the National Army 
Um, and I'll try this um, little uh, handy laser pointer that unfortunately I wasn't able to work with Frank, but I've worked out since um, earlier. Um, here on the right is where the National Army came in for that maritime landing into the docks that Joe was talking about in Passage West, moving up through the town under fire. Um, and you can recreate when you walk the ground, and this is so key, so vital, you have to walk the ground quite a lot um, and you begin to understand the routes that people took. You begin to able to read the routes that they took when they, based on what they're saying. Um, and so we've been able to reconstruct the, if you like, um, Republican retreat out of passage and the subsequent advance. This is the day one fighting, the subsequent advance of the National Army forces to the very heavy fight in the Rochestown area um, that constitutes the day two, the key fighting for the battle for Cork. There is a day three to the fighting as well, which occurred in Douglas, in and around Douglas, um, which we haven't got to yet, but there are also significant um, remains surviving there. Um, and it was this that caused the IRA to withdraw from Cork. So fundamentally, it is the victory in Cork for the National Army. The war then descends into a guerrilla campaign, leading nine days later um, to the death of um, Michael Collins. Um, but we were seeking to see what buildings survive and what don't survive, because when you don't have anything on the ground and it hasn't been analysed in any way, you can't manage these type of landscapes, as we've been pointing out um, throughout. And again, just to reiterate, so the types of documents that we use, um, I suppose to put it bluntly, it's not rocket science. Um, it, 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 we saw Tara demonstrating some of the ways in which we can analyse these, but Often there's lots of very significant contemporary photos, like we'll be seeing this one again momentarily here down in the bottom, which is a National Army artillery shell, which is smashed through one of the stately homes in the area um, in and around Rochestown. Um, but a lot of the contemporary accounts are published in newspapers, um, National Army men who were engaged in the, in the action, for example, um, um, their, their movements are being reported in the local press. And Again, you can find location indicators for this sort of material. Joe also showed us this map, which is invaluable to us. And again, uh, th these can be a bit tricky to decipher sometimes because this map is not actually um, on the face of it accurate. You can't place this over a current map and work out where everything is. But when you begin to paste everything into the landscape, you can see that the general areas in which he's talking about are identifiable. Uh, and I do have a golden rule that worked a charm when we were doing the battle for Cork analysis is that you always spend the first day doing field work completely lost and can find nothing and then can find everything the second day. It works every single time. It's a great trick. Um, so don't ever get worried if you're out trying to find these things, you can find nothing. Um, but obviously we were helped here by some incredibly famous photographs from things like the Hogan collection that Joe again was referencing here. This one of one of the National Army armored cars under sniper fire, um, under fire in Passage West. Um, and Joe pointed out um, this sequence of images before, but we were doing this type of thing on the ground where we were looking at the images and then saying, well, what's in this image? Very simple, but immediately you're seeing what's surviving in this image. Um, and for example, it allows you to locate others. So if you look at the building on the right of this um, um, image here that's still extant, it is the build, same building that's at the far end of the road here. So it allows you to place this action in the landscape. Um, this is another shot of Joe was showing us the, the impact scarring, but it's worth noting why we know this is National Army fire. So the accounts where, if you like, the viewer, where the viewer is standing is the dockside where the National Army were coming out. And we know that the initial fire after they landed was coming from Republican troops who were on high ground above them. One of the National Army soldiers discusses the fact that they were, uh, uh, there were fire coming from up an escarpment. So undercover, the National Army men are firing their bullets, and you have to imagine that there are Republicans in this vicinity, in the area up here, and these are strikes because this building is getting in the way of that target. So that allows you to identify it as National Army outgoing fire. Um, again, uh, Joe was mentioning Carry Glow on Great Island, and this is the channel. So this is the docks in the foreground where the National Army landed, um, and Great Island was held by the Republican forces who opened fire on them across the water. And so in the higher areas of Passage West, we were able to identify fire, fired from these uh, houses here, from these windows across the water. And when we went over to the other side to carry Galow, um, you can see here impacts on the frames. These are the buildings here. Not a great shot here, but 
more with impact scars. And this is fire from the National Army boats over at um, Republican positions. Um, just to return back to the map again, we did things like look at the position of the National Army artillery fire and where they were, um, uh, their arc of fire, if you like. And looking specifically at buildings that were and were not, um, that, that are present in the landscape that are, are not there today. Just to reiterate again, Gary Buckwoods here is a major local amenity that sees huge numbers of people walking in it every day. And there is absolutely nothing here to say that they are in the middle of one of the most significant battlefields of the Irish Civil War. This just demonstrates for you some of the uh, what we do. Again, we saw a bit of it earlier on. This is Old Court Domain here. Um, and this building up here, which was a farmhouse, in 1922 is no longer extant. It would have been subject to artillery fire coming in in this area. Undoubtedly, would be the remains of artillery fire here. And we know that there was artillery fire in this area, not just because of the accounts. But that old courthouse is this photograph. This is the same building here um, with the men, the National Army, um, and the owners of the house standing um, around where the shell pierced that structure as National Army fire came across this direction towards the Republicans. Um, Sorry, Damien, we're just getting a bit of uh, interference when you use the laser point on audio, so maybe... Oh, uh, I'll stop. Yeah, yeah perfect, <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, so the, um, yeah, and again, it's just to reiterate this point that not everything has to be about the fighting, even in these um, lo locales. We know, for example, in the building here in the top left, um, in, in the Dominicans, there the, were the... the Nas um, Republican soldiers the day before the battle in and around Roaches Town um, actually had mass in there um, and that they were stationed in and around the area and some of the dead are taken here afterwards. Also, once again, this major sports complex that um, Joe was talking about earlier on, everybody drives past this building, which was under unbelievable fire, but was absolutely filled with National Army soldiers. Oh, every inch of this building was filled with National Army soldiers who were wounded in the fighting for the Battle of Cork. Um, but again, I'm just going to wrap it up here, but I think if there was one thing I would like to everyone to be left with out of today, um, it, it's field boundaries. <laughs> we, we spoke about the, 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 Joe mentioned the field boundaries, we've mentioned them in relation to a lot of sites, but in, in particularly rural conflict zones, they tend to be, they're the equivalent of trenches um, for, for the Western Front. Um, and their importance in understanding what occurred at these uh, locations and their importance in recognizing which ones are contemporary and which are not is vital if we're to manage these landscapes. The top image here is the view from Gary Duff um, uh, from the sports center here up this high ground. And those National Army men that Joe was talking about under machine gun fire had to move through those fields beyond. They were congregated along the bottom hedge here beyond the hockey field, um, had to push through those fields beyond up to face into um, Republican machine gun fire that was positioned at the very top of that hill, Cronin's Cottage is at the top of that hill, um, coming through unbelievable fire. Um, and the bottom image is a ditch where one of those Republican machine guns was set up um, just near that battlefield gate, where a bunch of National Army soldiers came up over the rise in front of them at practically point blank range um, into this battlefield gate that we saw, um, we know from the accounts that a number of men died immediately on the interior of this gate. National Army men who were caught by the machine gun fire at point blank range. We know that a man was seriously wounded directly to the other side of this gate. So this is in a major, major combat area, one of the most significant ones in, in the entire island of Ireland. Um, and it, it just shows... Um, we spent effectively the equivalent of about two and a half to three days trying, trying to analyze this site. And this is the sort of material that, that's emerging from them, that if we can start to do it for more and more sites, there's an awful lot out there and it can completely revitalize um, the way in which we, we interact with these landscapes and gives a huge opportunity for us to understand the whole period um, in, in new ways. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it at that.